All right, how's it going, everybody? We are here on Friday, March 5th. Today, we're going to be talking about section uh, 7.2 in our uh, second edition book right here. And actually, I didn't check real quick. What's our section in our in our fourth edition book right here? Um, yeah, it looks like we're in section. Looks like a chapter seven methods are going to or chapter seven sections are going to match up. We're going to talk about all the sections we're going to cover here. So it looks like this matches right here. We're going to talk about improving Euler's method to get a method that's called improved Euler's method, also known as Hune's method. Uh, H E U N. You can see above my head right here. Before I start, I want to talk about the things that are above my head right here. This week we're going to cover section seven two and seven three. You're going to hit up some seven one in the homework assignment. We're going to talk a little bit about it today as well. What's coming up in the next three weeks, all right? So this is our week that is immediately before spring break. Week eight is where we're at right now. This week is, right, I'm making this video on March 5th right now, but technically week eight starts on March 8th. That's the Monday. March 8th through 12th is Monday through Friday. That is week eight. March 15th through 19th is a Monday through Friday. That's spring break. So that's the week the first week after this week. The week after spring break, two weeks after this week, uh, apparently, that's baby week, much to my wife's dismay and discomfort. Uh, our daughter uh, is hanging out for a little while longer. Um, so it appears that uh, while I was thoroughly planning on even this past week or this coming week being baby week, it's not apparently going to be for a little bit later here. Um, so what's going to be happening is there's spring break week is coming up after week eight. The week after spring break, we're not going to cover new content. The only thing that's going to happen is I'm going to put out a midterm exam in Canvas and you guys are going to take the midterm. Um, so what's going to happen is that sometime at the end of spring break, I am going to send an announcement out in Canvas that's going to say to you something like, expect for me to post the midterm on this day and at this time and it will be due on this day and at this time. So there will be sort of a pre-announcement to let you know. It's pro My plan is to have it posted on like Tuesday or Wednesday and for it to be due on a Friday. That's basically my plan. I haven't decided if I'm gonna do like 48 hours or 72 hours, uh, stuff like that. But like that's my soft plan is like during the week, I will post it and it will be due. Um, this is like one of the only deadlines of the year that I like actually care about right here. I've been terrible with my deadlines. I know that some of you guys have got a little soft in your homework deadlines. Uh, I think that's mostly okay. The midterm is the one thing that I'm going to be like, you really need to turn it in by the deadline and, and you need to do that. Um, but that's the only thing that's happening the week after spring break. No new content, no homework, just a midterm the week after spring break. Then the week after that, which will be starting on Monday, March 29th, uh, that's when we're going to pick back up with regular content. The nice thing is, is that 7273 and then a little bit of the 71 stuff in the homework, that wraps up our numerical methods unit and that'll bring us back into our, our regular course of, of topics in the course here. Um, getting back into chapter three. Chapter three is a meaty, meaty chapter. Uh, to uh, I, 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 Sorry to the vegetarians out here, but chapter three is a gigantic 24 ounce steak. It's It's a huge piece of meat. Um, it's got a bunch of cool stuff in it that's all very deeply interrelated, um, but we're going to be looking heavily in chapter three at linear systems. Um, and so that's going to be what we're going to pick up in our last week of March. It starts March 29th is that week 10 of class, right? So week eight is right now, the week before spring break. Spring break isn't a week. Week nine is baby week, just a midterm. Week 10 is where we're starting chapter three stuff right here. All right. So that's kind of where we're headed right here. Okay, great, so that's our plan. So where are we at today? We're gonna to talk about improving Euler's method. And so basically the deal is this. In the last two weeks, we've used Euler's method to produce numerical estimates to differential equations, as well as using it to produce uh, like graphs of our solutions, which is really practical here. Euler's method is really the simplest possible way to do this. And what that really means is I wanna make the statement that it's not very accurate, but what we're seeing when we're writing these programs is we can get as much accuracy as we want. We just have to bump up that number of subdivisions to some potentially kind of ridiculously large number, right? Like we did like a million subdivisions before. That's, uh, I hope that you can see that that's sort of technologically limiting right there, even though we have a computer to do this for us and it only takes like 10 seconds. Imagine that you have much, much more complicated differential equations that you want to get very, very accurate estimates for that you maybe need to produce new estimates every couple every couple minutes or something like that because some parameters are constantly changing. You're predicting weather or something like that. We don't want to have to be depending on doing millions of subdivisions every single time. What we'd like is an algorithm that's more efficient, can get just as much accuracy, but doesn't have to break this thing down into millions and millions of subdivisions over some desired interval. All right. So what we're going to look at this week in seven 
seven two and in seven three is two improved uh, techniques for estimating solutions to differential equations. Um, we're going to find they're going to produce very accurate estimates using way fewer subdivisions than Euler's method, meaning we can get, get good estimates, but by doing less computation, so we can get much quicker estimates here. So let's go to our little overview right here. Last week, we looked at Euler's method. We used it for individual differential equations as well as systems of differential equations. What I want to throw out to you right now is that Euler's method is very analogous to left and right Riemann sums. It is the simplest possible thing that you could ever do. When I say to you, what kind of areas would you choose to calculate? You should say rectangles because it's the easiest ones. When I say to you, what types of uh, curves do you want to imitate? You should say lines because they're the easiest ones, right? That's our Euler's method versus Riemann sums right there. It's the easiest possible version of the thing. But what we saw when you learn about uh, like uh, Riemann sums is that doing our left and right hand sums are always going to introduce some error and that there's actually some better techniques that we can do other than just left and right Riemann sums if we want to get estimates for areas underneath the curve. I know half you guys took Calc 2 with me last semester and we talked about these other things. Today we're going to look at section 7.2, Hune's method or improved Euler's method. This is very closely analogous to us upgrading from left and right Riemann sums to the trapezoid rule for Riemann sums. A very similar idea. We can improve the estimate if we, instead of just looking at a single y value, like with the left and right Riemann sums, where one y value is the corner of your rectangle, the trapezoid rule says, let's consider two adjacent y values, average their heights, and use that as our height estimate each time. That gave us much improved estimates in Calc 2 for our integrals. It's going to be the exact same idea and it's going to give us much improved uh, approximations to our differential equations here. Um, so basically today, you should think of today as being as analogous to saying we're upgrading from left and right Riemann sums to the trapezoid rule. In the next video, we're going to look at section 7.3, which is the runge kutta method, also referred to as RK4. And one of my questions for today, before we get to the next video is, why do they call it RK4? This is closely analogous to Simpson's rule for Riemann sums, right? What you remember about Simpson's rule is that's where we used a parabola to estimate the area underneath a parabola rather than the area underneath a flat line, which is a rectangle, or the area underneath a slanted line, which is a trapezoid. We instead said, what if we made a parabolic estimate of the curve and found the area underneath that? But what you guys know about parabolas is they require three points worth of information to get that parabolic information there. That's exactly what we're going to do with the runge kutta method here is we're going to bring in a third. So notice that today we're going to do the trapezoid rule, averaging two adjacent y values to get our, our, our slope of interest. In the next video, we're going to be looking at three different y values and using combinations, a weighted sum of several different slopes that we get from three points to make our estimate of the direction that we should be moving in. And because we're using more points worth of information, we're going to get more accuracy with each of the steps that we do in the process right there. You should notice that we're skipping skipping section 7.1. We're not really skipping it. I'm even saying that we're doing it in the homework. I'm going to cover like half of 7.1 incidentally today anyway. But 7.1 is really like the key conclusion conclusions that we want to be able to draw from what we're doing here, which is really, how do we measure how much better any of these techniques is than anything else? Like, we can look at the error of estimating a solution with Euler's versus improved Euler's versus Runge Kutta 4, but how do we like make a measurement of saying this technique is X times better than this technique right here? That's the kind of conclusions that we want to state. They introduce how to think about that in 7.1, but we really can't make those determinations until we've covered 7.2 and 7.3, which is why I'm kind of going a little bit out of order here and not like explicitly having a day that's 7.1. Right? But that's what 7.1 is going to cover. Is how do we compare these techniques directly to one another? So let's go ahead and look at what we're doing. Today we're looking at our improved Euler's method and I want to say this analogy to you that's at the top of the screen. My analogy here, here's my analogy word as Euler's method is to left and right rule for Riemann sums as improved Euler's method is to the trapezoid rule for Riemann sums. We're going to use a second points information and average the two. Right? So you guys remember that for our left and right endpoints out here, the whole deal was the important thing is one point of information is what's used versus two points of information is what's used. And then when we go to Simpson's rule, AKA uh, the Runge Kutta 4 method, RK4, there are going to be three points of information that we're going to be using out there. So this is saying the more data we use to make our estimate, 
I hope it's not terribly surprising that our estimates are going to be better, right? It's going to point us more uh, accurately in the right direction relative to the overall behavior of the curve by looking a little bit more in the future at what's happening out there, all right? So when we came up with these rules, uh, we, we determined for our left-hand rule that we're going to get something like the sum from i equals 0 to n of delta x. So delta x is the width of each rectangle. And it looks like with our, our so this right here is our right-hand rule because the point is on the right corner. That's where it intersects. If we're looking at our left-hand rule, I think that this should be f of x sub i minus 1 because I'd want to start at x sub 0. The, that would be a, our, our initial value right there for i equals 0. If this was the right-hand rule, that would just be i down there because we sort of just shift to the right by 1 of where we're considering all of our endpoints for our measurements. I say that this is equivalent to uh, or analogous to an Euler's method. I'll draw my big analogous to symbol right there because in Euler's method, we also just do a, a, a linear update right here, right? So this is y sub k equals y sub k minus i plus f of t sub k minus i y sub k minus i, or sorry, minus 1 uh, times delta right there so we're just doing y equals mx plus b that's like us looking at a rectangle right there right it's the simplest possible area the simplest possible curve the trapezoid rule though is a little bit different what we can see here is that if we want to think about the area of a trapezoid what I can think to myself is that this rectangle plus this rectangle divided by 2 is going to be I'm going to mark this as A and this as B. That's A. That's B. It's going to give us that trapezoid right there. So it looks like what we're doing is we're averaging two heights, heights that I just called capital A and capital B. And if we average the two rectangles heights right here, then we're going to get the trapezoid that we're using for our estimation right here. Right? So for our trapezoid rule, this could be written as the sum from I equals 0 to N of delta x, that hasn't changed, but notice here we're now looking at our f of x sub i minus 1 plus f of x sub i. Oh, I see what I did right here, by the way. I, I'm So notice here if we start at i equals 0 on this guy, that gives us x sub negative 1. That doesn't make any sense. I'm trying to, I feel like I often write this slightly different than our textbook does, and our textbook starts these at 1, and I always think to start at 0 right here. Um, but the point is, I always just plug in this first value to see if it makes sense. i equals 1 says our first value is x sub 0, which makes sense for our left-hand rule. Over here, if we start at 1, I want to be using x sub 0, and x sub 1 is my two points and averaging them. And that's going to be the height that I'm going to use for each of my uh, trapezoid areas right there. Very similarly, for improved Euler's method, we're just going to do that our uh, estimate for y sub k is going to be y sub k minus 1. And again, we're just going to average two slopes right here. This is going to be f of t sub k minus 1, y sub k minus 1. That's our previous point in time, plus, uh oh, I'm going to run out of room here, uh, t sub k. Oh, no, I'm not because these are shorter to write. y sub k, all divided by 2, and times delta t in there, right? So what we're doing is we're averaging the current uh, slope to the next slope that we're going to see. But here's the really, really important issue that we run into that makes this not just simply throw an average into your computations. What you should notice our issue is here is that we want to use the current point that we're at t sub k minus 1, y sub k minus 1, to predict the next point, the sub k's, the kth point. We're using k minus 1 to predict where we are at k. But notice that our formula has y sub k in it. So we can't predict y sub k because it requires y sub k to know, to be known. So what are we going to do? Well, how might you get y sub k? Well, here's a way that we could get y sub k. So what are, are, are the little the little bit of the tricky part to improve Euler's method is that this to me makes sense, except until I recognize that y sub k is on both sides of the equation, and this is supposed to be an equation to produce y sub k, right? So what we're going to think to ourselves is that this is a good way for us to estimate the y sub k that we need to use, an estimate for y sub k, to make our prediction for what we actually think y sub k is going to be, but a better prediction right there. So this is going to be... Uh, you know, 
prediction inception right here. We have to predict a value, uh, uh, do a bad job of predicting a value for y sub k, the bad job meaning Euler's method, right? We're going to use that bad job prediction of y sub k as our future point y sub k to average the slope at the current point in time and the next point in time to actually use that as our improved, our good estimate of where y sub k is going to be in the future, right? So, so there's two layers of estimates. This actually has a whole Euler's method stuck inside of averaging two slopes right here to get the slope that we're actually going to use for the direction that we're going to travel in to get to our next point on the y curve out here, all right? So this, this is the problem. So this is me kind of laying it out right here. So we have a little bit of a problem. To predict y sub k, we need to know y sub k minus 1 and y sub k. Well, that's a problem, right? Since we don't have uh, an estimated value for y sub k yet, we're going to estimate it with regular Euler's method, right? So I've highlighted the things that we want to look at here. So this is the improved Euler's method right here, but we can't use it directly like this, right? So, and by the way, there is just gonna be a ton of writing and notation on the screen. I really want you to stop and actually make sure that you get all the notation here. This is not beyond you. This looks like a bunch of difficult math here, and I promise you, this is literally a bunch of y equals mx plus b's jammed into each other, plus an average included. There's nothing more than that. Don't let these subscripts make you afraid. I'm gonna talk through all these parts right now. Get this, this is not, this looks way worse than it is, all right? So our deal here is this is y equals b plus mx, where our slope is really the average of two slope estimates, the slope at one point and plus the slope at a slightly later point. But the whole point is we're trying to predict where that later point is, so it's hard for us to get our slope estimate. So this term that I've grayed right here is how what we're going to do is we're going to estimate what f of t k y k is using regular Euler's method right here. This is regular Euler's method, predict y sub k using y sub k minus 1. And I'm just therefore going to substitute in this expression here, right? So this is exactly this right there. I just subbed it in for y sub k in the previous thing right here. All right, that's all that happened right there. Y sub k became Euler's method estimate for y sub k is all that happened, right? Now, the thing that you should be knowing, or noticing, excuse me, is that this f of t sub k minus 1, y sub k minus 1, that's sort of like our slope at our current location. I'm thinking of current as our k sub my, i minus 1 and our next as sub k. Let me, let me say that right here. So this is using our current time once right here, but again, right here. So it looks like we're gonna to want to use that sort of in two different locations in our estimate right here, right? So the book does a very smart thing notationally here that's gonna help us out a lot with our writing some code for this, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna call our slope at time k minus one, m is our slope, and our slope is exactly equal to the function that is our differential equation, right? This is dy dt evaluated at the current time, t sub k minus 1, right? We also want a different slope, though. This is our slope at our later time. This is like our current slope and our next slope. We're averaging those two. It's just like with our, uh, with our trapezoid method up here, we took our current location plus our next location divided by two. Those were heights. We're just averaging slopes instead of heights, right? Um, so we're gonna compute n sub k minus one. And notice that this is really t sub k, y sub k. That's y sub k right there, except it's estimated by Euler's method. And so what we're gonna get is, we're gonna know the next time. It's just add delta t, that's not hard to get. Knowing y sub k is something that we have to make a prediction for right here, all right? 
So then we're going to be able to use m sub k minus 1 and n sub k minus 1. Those are our two slopes, the current slope and the next slope. We're just averaging those slopes to use them in the place of our slope term that's right there, right? So this is good. This idea of creating these new variables m and n to think about our slope at the current location, our slope at the next location, and finding the average of those two slopes is a really smart programming idea because in programming, we want to create those variables to hold that type of information. So what our algorithm should be looking like for our improved Euler's method is this. First, compute m sub k minus 1, and notice that only requires us to just use the function that we've defined. This is, this is just basically, this step one right here is just all of Euler's method, right? Estimate the slope by this, update with the y sub k using that slope. In improved Euler's method, though, we want to compute an additional slope, and notice that this requires the f function to get n, and it requires the m that we've previously calculated in there as well, right? So using f and the m sub k minus 1 that we just came up with on the previous line, compute n sub k minus 1. Now we can make our prediction for y sub k based on the average of those two slopes that we've come up with. So it's our slope at our current time, averaged with our slope at a later time, that's then the slope that we're going to use. And essentially, this line to you should just look to you back like original Euler's method again. The only difference is where we get our slope term from has changed slightly. Even the same thing once we get our Runge cut of 4 method. This term in parentheses here is just going to be, uh, you know, this big instead of this big instead of one term right there, right? We're just changing how we compute the slope, getting better and better slope estimates. And what direction should we travel to best imitate the, the differential equation solution is what we're asking ourselves. So this is going to be our, our Python algorithm right here for improved Euler's method. Step one, compute a variable called m. It should only be the f function applied to the current time and the current y value. Then compute n. It should require the function f and a little bit of m, the value that we previously computed. Once I know m and n, I can use them to find the next y value of interest using just a y equals mx plus b once again right there. All right. So I, I don't think that this code is going to, like a lot of this structure is going to be the same. I think our code's like 90% the same between last stuff and current stuff. We just have to be a little bit more careful about producing this averaging situation and recognizing that we can't find the slope at the next point because we don't know where the next point is yet. So we're going to do a bad estimate of where that point is to get an estimate for the slope to average the two slopes to use the average two slopes to make a good estimate of where the next point is going to be a little bit weird right there but uh it's going to work out pretty nicely here let's go ahead and do the dang thing for the rest of today we're going to be looking at our python stuff here so let's pop on over there so here i am in my jupyter notebook and i'm just going to start one from scratch here today so let's go ahead and make a, a new python 3 notebook right here let's zoom in a little bit so we can see a little bit better so what are we doing here? Let me get my, my stylus out of the way and let's go for it here. So I'm going to type out this whole dang thing. I thought about writing like a shell for this code here today, like sort of like a structure for it. I just want to see you guys see me write the entire thing right here. So first, I'm going to give myself a little title. Uh, by the way, a couple keyboard shortcuts. You guys have noticed that we occasionally want to switch between uh, code and markdown cells. Uh, if I press escape, watch, watch, watch the word markdown right now. I pressed escape and now I press Y and it switches me to code, I could press enter and I can start writing again. I can press escape to get back out of this mode. I'm, by the way, uh, oh, oh, see, I just started typing and it didn't type words. It started using keyboard shortcuts. When this is green, it's ready for you to write. When it's in blue, it's expecting that you're doing more general commands here. So the three commands that I ever use are in escaped mode right here when things are blue. M and Y switch us between code and markdown. I'm just typing M, Y, M, Y, M, Y. Markdown is M, code is Y. The other thing that I often use as my other keyboard shortcut is the letter B will produce a new cell. So this is just me hitting B over and over when I'm in escaped mode right here. Um, so back up here, notice it's green. That means I'm typing. If I press escape, it turns blue and that means I'm not typing. It's now expecting like a keyboard shortcut, which is just one letter shortcut. So Y, B and M are my three primary keyboard shortcuts that I like here. So I'm in a code cell. So I'm gonna press escape, M, enter. And now I'm typing in a markdown cell right here. So what am I doing? I'm doing uh, section 7.2, improved Euler's method. Newton's method, other name for that guy right there. Um, and so our first example, let's, uh, let's uh, use improved Euler's method
the math right here, y of 4. So I'll throw that in some dollar signs right there. Using 20 subdivisions for the initial value problem. Now I'm going to state my differential equation and its initial condition right here. Um, I'm going to do dy dt equals t minus y squared. So I'm going to start a math line right here. I want to make a fraction. dy is the numerator, dt is the denominator, equals, and we're going to do the equation here of t minus y squared. And I also want my initial condition on the same line. So I'm going to do my comma. Quad is what gives me that horizontal spacing. I think that's four spaces, I think, is what quad is trying to indicate right there. And then my initial con uh, condition will be y of 0 equals 1 and a dollar sign to end math mode right there. Um, and just to double check it, I'm going to shift enter. And it looks like the math mode stuff worked out nicely right there. So I've got that nice and typed in right there. Let me get this out of there right there. There we go. Um, and I do want to point something out here. Now notice that t minus y squared. Is not separable or linear in y. So, and I would recommend you should go ask Wolfram Alpha to find the solution to this problem for you. And you should laugh out loud when you see the gigantic pile of garbage it gives you as your output right there. By the way, uh, instead of using dy dt at Wolfram Alpha, it will interpret that as partial derivatives. You should just use y prime if you're ever asking uh, Wolfram to like solve a differential equation for you like that. All right. So, um, all right, let's do all the things that we know to do here. Step one, always do imports at the top. Uh, it's just a general programming thing. Let people know what libraries you're going to be using. We, we're going to use the same to import NumPy as NP. We're going to import matplotlib.pyplot as PLT. Those are our two standards right there. A numerical estimates, or a math library and plotting library, basically. I'm going to run that. No errors. All good. Let's go ahead and define our function of interest. Uh, in this case, we're going to define f of ty colon to be t minus y. By the way, uh, I don't know, oh, we got to do a return to tell it this is the output, not just a computation. Notice that double asterisk is the exponentiation thing for Python, not the caret symbol. Um, the caret symbol is used for uh, a binary operator. Um, so like that, that's for doing math operations between two binary numbers. Um, I think the caret does the AND operation between two binary numbers. Anyway, it's a binary operator. It's not exponentiation. Uh, use y uh, star star 2. Or you know that that's the same thing. y times y is y squared. Actually, funny little Python note. It's actually more efficient computationally to do y times y than to do y squared. But I also feel like that introduces sort of like some, um, I don't know. Then I have to think, and, and I'd rather not have to think right there. So anyway, there is my function of interest. Uh, f of t is t minus y squared. We're going to go ahead and initialize parameters just like we've been doing. Uh, so what are the parameters that we need to define that are associated with this prediction? Well, I want my initial conditions. So things like t0 is 0 y0 is 1. Those are like my initial conditions associated with the, uh, the differential equation right there. Some other things that I know is I need my final time, I'll call capital T, is going to be 4. I know that my number of subdivisions is going to be 20. And using those things, I can compute what my delta T is going to be. So my delta T should always be my final time minus my initial time divided by my number of subdivisions right there. Um, and just as a quick checker for this, let's just see what dt looks like here. And it is 0.2, and that's good because I know we're going from 0 to 4. Wait, did I say 0 to 4 up here, by the way? Oh, I did. I said that we're trying to estimate y of 4 right there. So I know that that's going to be my, uh, my final time right there. So y of 0 is initial time, y of 4 is final time. 0 to 4, splitting up into 20 chunks should be giving us one-fifth for each chunk, and we're getting that. So I feel good about my like setup right now. 
Um, so I'll go ahead and get rid of that cell right there. That was just my like little double checker for that guy. The other thing that I know that we need to initialize right here is the lists that are going to hold all of our, our data that we're producing, right? So this is where we use NumPy to make those linearly spaced lists right here. So I'm going to make my T list to be, I'm going to say, hey, NumPy, can you make a linearly spaced list, np.lin space? Uh, I want this list to start at my starting time. I want it to end at my ending time. And remember here the fence post problem that since I want 20 subdivisions, I actually need 21 posts to make 20 pieces of fence. And so that's where I'm using n plus one. That plus one is a tricky plus one right there. It's a, uh, a lot of programming is off by one errors and these aren't super, super easy to see. I wanna convince you that this is correct right here. I'm gonna leave the plus one off and let's look at t-list. Oops, oh, 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 what did I just... Uh... Okay, apparently L gives line numbers and Shift L gives you all of your line numbers. See, I'm learning new keyboard shortcuts. You can just press escape and make this blue and just pound down your keyboard and see things change and learn some new keyboard shortcuts. There we go. L gives you line numbers and sometimes that's really helpful when you're you know, looking at complicated things. You can say on line 14, I have this problem right there. Um, I, don't, I don't want those right here. Let's take a look at T list right here and notice that T, uh, oh wait, did I rerun this? I did not re, oh wait, that did just get me to four. Wait, do I only want to go? Okay, maybe we don't need that plus one right there. I did give myself a little bit of plus one confusion on this guy, I'll, I'll tell you that right here. Th this is fine, I think that it just, okay, I'm fine with that right here. Let's go ahead and, and if we see some error come up in the future, we can come back and fix this right there. But I think that's, that should be fine right there. A linearly spaced list. Uh, with 20 different points right there going out to the, the final value four. And this is why Jupyter Notebook is nice because you can just run code and see what it looks like so far um, rather than just having to hope that you're doing everything right the whole way. This is why it's good to kind of run code line by line here. The other thing that we want is we want a Y list, but I don't know what's gonna be in that yet. So this is where I'm just gonna make a, a list of zeros that has the same length as my T list. I just want the Y list to be exactly as long as the T list but I just want to fill it with zeros for right now. So I'm going to say, hey, NumPy library, make me a list of zeros. How long do you want to be? I don't know, however long the T list is. That's exactly what we're doing right there. But the deal is we actually do know the very first thing that should go in the Y list. The first thing at index zero in the Y list should be our initial condition, Y zero right there, right? So let's now double check that our Y list looks like we think it should. Our Y list looks like it's gonna be that 20 things long and it does start at one, which is where our Y values should start for our estimate. At time zero, we're at a Y value of one right there. Cool. So now let's go ahead and let's do improved Euler's method. Okay, so what is it that we're doing here? Well. Uh, we want to do a, a for loop again, right? Because we want to say update the value of y all 20 times and every time put our new estimate into the y list right here. So I'm going to do uh, for i in range. We, we know that we want to skip the first one because we've already done it. We don't want to deal with index zero because index zero has already been handled right there. We want to start at really the, the second y value, which is at index one according to Python. So I'm going to start my range at one how far do I want to go? However long the Y list is. That's the, the start and the stop for what, how many passes through this thing I want to do, right? So our I value is going to start at one. It's going to end at one fewer than the length of the Y list, which will be perfect for the indices that we want to use here, right? So let's remind ourselves what we're doing here. We said that we're first going to compute M using just F. Then we're going to compute N using F and M. Then we're going to use that to make our update to Y and store the Y in the Y list right there. So it looks like to compute M, it's just apply F to our current T and our current Y. Right? So let's go ahead and do that over here. To compute M, oops, to compute M should just be F being applied to our current T. Now current to me means the value of I that's being held by our for loop right here. So I'm going to say, well, whatever the current value is in our T list, excuse me, uh, we want the previous value in the T list right here. Now notice, I is currently, I starts at one. So when I do T list of I minus one right here, it's going to do one minus one to get zero. And that says it's at the zeroth index in the T list or the first object in the T list. So this will grab our initial time. 
We also want the y list at our initial uh, spot right there, so the i minus one. That's our slope from our current location. And just like I wrote in the notes, the i minus one is really like our current. I is really like our next one that we're trying to make a prediction on. So now we want to come up with what our next slope is right here. And what we know is that this is going to be like doing some f of something. It's a slope, so we're just getting it out from our differential equation expression right here, the f function. But what is it going to be? Well, we know that we're going to use, and let me just pop back over again real quick here. We know to get n, we're actually going to use the next time. So this is just t sub k, or t indexed at i. But it looks like we need to get this whole expression uh, in here as what the y value is that we want to use. So this, this, is, this line that we're looking at right here, this is essentially exactly what I want to use in my Python code right here. The only difference is when I say t sub k, I need to say things like t list bracket k. y sub k minus 1, y list bracket i minus 1 because we're using the indexer of i right here for right now for a good reason because we're about to bring in k's in a minute. So back over here in Python now, I'm going to go ahead and do this. I'm going to say n is my estimate at the next point in time. So this is going to be t list at just i. It's at the next in time index right here. But I don't, I can't, what I can't do is this because that value is zero right now. We haven't filled it in in the y list. So what I really am going to do is I'm going to do Euler's method right here. There's Euler's method being plopped into that thing right there. It's the previous value of y going in the slope as determined at the previous value of y for one dt units of time. This is our estimate for y list at i because we don't currently have a value for that. It's just sitting as a zero in the y list right now. We're, we're trying to come up with it. But now that I have m as my current slope, n as my estimate of my next slope, I can now use those as the average slope. I can average them and use that average as the slope that I want to update y with. Right? So now what we're going to get, and I'm going to use one extra variable right here. I'm going to call this new y. It's an underscore right there. New y should be whatever our uh, old value of y is. There's my old value of y, my current value of y, plus I want m plus n over 2. That's the slope of, that I want to move in. It's an average of two slopes. And I want to do that for dt units of time right here. So to get my new y value, I take my old y value and I add to it the average of the two slopes, and I do that slope for dt units of time. So this still this is our y equals mx plus b line right here. The only thing I really need to do for myself is stick new y into our y list. So y list at the ith location, that's what we were trying to come up with, is using y sub i minus 1, what is y sub i? Well, I'm going to plug in y, I'm going to uh, stick that into the list right now. At the ith index in y list, there's currently a 0 waiting for our input. Let's go ahead and put in the value that we just computed for new y right there. So kind of notice, technically speaking, you could have just done this as one line where y list i was sitting right there. Sometimes it's nicer for me to like really break these out, define things as variables. So it helps me do some like kind of, uh, you know, debugging if I ever have anything go wrong right there. But here's our improved Euler's technique right here. It's find the current slope, estimate the next slope, average those two slopes and use the average of those two slopes as our updating slope to get our new y location here all right and we've stuck it into the y list so let's go ahead and run this i am i am happy i'm getting no errors i'm guessing some of you guys are out there i'm sure you're gonna look back and clean this thing up let's look and see if this like worked like i don't know like sometimes i do this and i recognize and then i go back and i look and i realize that i still just have like a whole list of zeros or something like that let's see if we actually even got anything here and hey it looks like we did so it looks like according to my my estimates right here it looks like uh, i'm gonna do a markdown cell right here it looks like we've estimated that uh, y4 is approximately equal to 1.926. Right. Notice that approx with the slash right there is our indicator in LaTeX for that approximation symbol right there. And what I kind of want to know is, like, did we did we like do this right? You know. Um, and by the way, let me just check something real quick here.
Okay, cool. So what I want to know is like, how do we even know if we did a decent job right here? Well, let's go ahead and plot our solution. So notice we straight up cannot come up with an explicit solution for this. You, you cannot solve this differential equation directly can't do it and it's not that you can't it's that nobody can because this does or it's not like it's, there's no way to express it uh you need to like go to graduate school to figure out how to even write out the solution for this and like focus your study on solutions to differential equations in graduate school that's how you're going to get a solution for this guy um so the, maybe the best thing i can do is like ask some other source if if they agree with our estimate right there um so what i'm thinking we should do is let's plot this and let's see if our plot looks like the plot that we got at bluffton right um, and so, and by the way, maybe just to double check, like does our T list really go from zero to four with 20 things? Yeah, I see four rows, five columns. We've got 20 subdivisions. It starts at zero, ends at four. I feel pretty good that this is like a T, Y uh, list of 20 ordered pairs that are exactly what I was looking for. So let's go ahead and plot this guy. Plot dot plot, T list comma Y list. Let's go ahead and do plot dot show. And I'm seeing this curve out here. I'm always bothered when my axes don't start at zero, right? This Y axis did not start at zero right there. Uh, and that always kind of bothers me. So I'm gonna throw in uh, two extra things right here, which is I'm gonna do a plot dot axis. It wants a list of X min, X max, Y min, Y max. I'm gonna go from zero, X from zero to four. Or really I should do from zero to T if I'm being responsible here. And the, uh, the, the upper bounds right here, I think, uh, and this one, I guess I can't be as responsible with this one. I'm just going to go from zero to about, looks like this guy's going up to about two right here, um, from zero to two. Really the whole purpose of this one is that zero is the thing that I really cared about to get my Y minimum down to zero. Those, my other bounds seemed okay. The X axis bound seemed okay. The upper bound for Y seemed okay. I also really like to have a grid on this. I just feel like it's easier for me to read this with the grid. That's a personal aesthetic preference right there. Um, but now we get a, maybe a, a slightly better looking graph. And you should notice, if you can see this, if my video is not too grainy, you can see that this is literally just 20 straight lines being tacked onto one another. It's hard for me to see it out here, but I can really see this as being like straight lines, like glued onto one, each other, one another. This is 20 straight lines, not a smooth curve right here. Let's go ahead and compare this curve to the one that we see out here at Bluffton. So I'm gonna get a new one here, go to Bluffton slope fields. Um, and when I throw in our equation, what was our equation? We were doing uh, t minus y squared. Uh, so that's x minus y squared according to Bluffton right here. Um, and importantly, I would like to change my bounds here. Oh gosh, it's doing this like gross. Oh wait, why is it doing, okay, weird. Um, I gotta change my screen size for that. I wanna exactly get the same bounds. So I'm gonna go from zero to four and then from zero to two to exactly mimic the bounds. Even better than that, when I go to my choices right here, I'm gonna pick improved Euler, also known as Hune. And in fact, we can even set our H value to be 0.2. That's our delta T that we knew that we had right there, right? And even more than that, I want the exact initial condition of zero one. This is the exact initial condition that we use. And we're getting this curve right here. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm feeling pretty good about the graph that we just came up with right there. Uh, it looks like it come dips down to being just, bo uh, just above 0.75. We're getting one just above 0.75 and then angles up. We can in fact even go down here to the numerical solutions right here and see that we got a, uh, a final estimate of 1.93038. Uh, and I'm seeing, uh, wait, why are we getting something? So I feel like this is that plus one difference that we're coming up with right here. So check this out. I'm, I'm actually a little, so I'm not overly worried about this, but just for the sake of like getting things to agree, why, I'm gonna make this difference here. All I'm gonna do is plus one right there. And I think that this is me disregarding the fence post problem, right? If we really only have 20 X locations, then that's really only 19 sub intervals. There's 19 gaps between 20 points. I want there to be one additional point so that there's actually 20 sub intervals, which would require 21 points right here. So I'm just gonna rerun my code now. So rerun, 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 rerun. Graph is looking essentially the same right there because it's really just one additional subdivision. Our points, ah, our, our times are still going from zero to four, but there's 21 of them now. I can show you that. Length of the T list is 21, right? Um, but notice, so I'm gonna update this now. 
That's exactly what they were getting. One point nine three zero three eight. So I think I was disregarding our fence post problem uh, issue right there. Uh, we need twenty one points to have twenty subdivisions, which is why I used n plus one instead of n as my number of uh, points to create for lin space. I wanted one more point than I have subdivisions because it takes one more fence post than number of pieces of fence to build a fence. Right. Um, and now again, this number one point. Uh, wait, did I just type that wrong? I did one point nine. 1.93038. Okay, now I have it right. 1.93038, 1.93038. So it looks like we're identically matching the solutions that we're getting from Bluffton over here. Oh, that feels really good. Improved Oilers, 0.2, exact same bounds, exact same initial condition, getting the exact same graph, getting the exact same numerical outputs. So this is where all this stuff is coming from right here. They're literally running the identical code that we're running here. Um, very cool here, very cool. Um, so. The good news about this is that we were able to do this and we checked it against a different resource and our resources agree. The bad thing about this is that I can't really tell that this is actually better than what Euler's method would have been because I don't have a true solution to compare it against. So what I wanna do now for our, our next uh, example right here um, is I want to do another example, but I wanna, I wanna bulk this thing up. And here's what we're gonna do for our next example. We're going to set up a differential equation that we can solve. So we'll have an actual solution to compare it against. That's one difference. I want to do both Euler's method and improved Euler's method so I can compare the two. And what I'm really interested in is comparing their error relative to that true solution and seeing how do the errors change between the two so that we can prove that improved Euler's is actually an improvement over Euler's and measure the sense in which it's an improvement. All right. Um, so. Notice, by the way, uh, individual asterisks surrounding italicizes, double asterisks, bold, triple asterisks, bolds, and italicizes. Cool little, uh, uh, you know, typesetting stuff going on right there. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to make a whole mess of estimates right here, final y values. Um, So what we're gonna do here is this. We're gonna do K subdivisions. That's why I've been saving the variable K here. If I do five subdivisions with Euler's and improved Euler's, how do they compare? Versus 10 subdivisions with Euler's and improved Euler's, how do they compare? Versus 15 subdivisions with Euler's and improved Euler's, and how do they compare? When I say how do they compare, what I really mean is how much does their error compare relative to the known exact solution right here? So. This code right here, I'm, gonna, I'm about to write kind of like a lot of code right here. Um, this is gonna be a little bit harder. I'm, you're all probably gonna have to do a little bit of pausing to, to kind of get back on board to follow along right here. Um, it's gonna be a little bit more complicated, but I know that this is gonna be a lot of stuff that we've already seen, so I'm gonna try and do it relatively fast. So this isn't just a two hour video for no reason here. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. Example. Estimate the value of y of 2 using k subdivisions using both Euler's and improved Euler's uh, for the initial value problem. Open up some math mode. Let's type out our equation here. We're going to do sine of t minus y. Sorry, what am I doing? dy dt equals sine of t minus y, comma, quad for the horizontal space, starting with the initial condition of y of 0 equals 0. We'll allow the number of subdivisions k to vary 
uh, or to be all integers. Okay, sorry. I think it's n is the notation that I'm looking for. 4 to 100. Let's stop and see if my math mode stuff looks good. So y of 2, k, dy dt equals sine of t minus y from y uh, with the initial condition y of 0 equals 0. We'll allow k to vary across all the integers in the interval from 4 to 100. Right? Um, now, our goal is to compare errors uh, between estimates using both methods and the true solution. It can be shown, since the differential equation is linear in y, that the true solution is, and I did all my math and my integration and blah 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 and I arrived at the solution of y of t equals one half oop, oop, frack that uh, here's some other uh, slightly fancy math uh, formatting things right here to have brackets or parentheses that will grow to any size needed depending on what's contained you can do slash left oh, and then left parenthesis uh, and then similarly we'll do that with a right on the right right here so I want sine of t minus cosine of t minus, uh, oh wait, isn't this the thing that I did ever so slightly wrong? I think that's a plus right there. Hold, hold. Yes, I dropped a negative when I, when I typed this out. I'm referencing my notes right now, but I remember finding that that's a plus. Uh, and this should be e to the power of negative t. Curly braces there are like my grouping symbol without a visible grouping symbol. I want to close the parentheses, so I'm going to do slash right parentheses. And by, again, including that slash left parentheses, this is one piece of like LaTeX code right there. And this is one piece of LaTeX code right there. And again, all that's doing is, uh, oh, that's too much right there, is um, making a variable size parentheses or bracket or any other grouping symbol instead of just like the standard size one right there. And dollar sign to end the math mode right there. And there we go. There's my good looking version of this true solution right here. So there's going to be a lot of stuff right here. So stick with me. You're going to know all these parts, but this is not something I would expect you guys to, to directly just come up with on your own right here. So um, let's define both functions we need. So here, we're going to define a uh, f of ty. That's our differential equation right here. Maybe I should just throw this in here. I feel like I should be saying like f of ty right there. Right? Um, f of ty is our differential equation function. We want this to return, and here's where we need some numpy. Numpy, what's the sine of t is what I'm asking it right there. And then minus y. We also need our true solution right here, right? We need to know y of t. So let me define this and I'll call this actual. Notice it only depends on t, so I'm only gonna throw a t in there. And we can return 0.5 times np dot sine of t. Oh, I did some extra parentheses right there. What was I doing? np dot sine of t. np dot sine of t minus np dot cos of t plus np dot exp of negative t. That's our functions for sine, cosine, and exponentiation. Python inherently knows none of them. We have to ask the NumPy library to help us out with those types of math functions right there. All right, so it looks like we can get our exact answer right here. All right, so I can see things like our, our just should just be actual two, right? So it looks like that's the value that we're actually looking to get um, at, our, at our final time right there of t of capital T, right? So that's our error that we're going to be comparing against. When we get our approximations, we're comparing them against this number that's right there. Um, so uh,
So here's my kind of thing I'm saying to you. Um, we're about to make one every integer from in K from four to 100. I guess that's actually 97 values right there, right? Um, like a whole mess of estimates right here. I wanna hold them in lists so I can look at, or sorry, errors. Um, okay. Here, sorry, I kind of mis misstated this right here. To compare them all to y of two um, to find all of their associated errors. Seems like we should make some lists to hold these errors. That's really what I'm trying to analyze right now. And by the, and again, this code's gonna get a little bit hairy. The conclusion we're gonna draw at the end is very, very important. So even if you're not coding along for a few minutes right here, you really have to see how we're con considering what's up with these errors at the end right here. This really matters, right? And we're about to have a bunch of variables, but we're gonna do two different methods for every single value of K. So I'm just gonna say all, the, all my variables with one will be regular Euler's method. All my variables with a two will be improved Euler's method stuff right here. Um, so, Let's do it. So I'm going to make an E1 list. Let's just leave it blank. And an E2 list. Let's leave it blank. Again, one and two, regular Euler's, improved Euler's. I'm just trying to use some shorthand right here. And by the way, I wish this thing would let me scroll down more sometimes. So that's why I make all my extra cells. We want to get the generic parameters that are going to be equivalent across both of these techniques, but these two techniques are a little bit different right here. So we're not going to get all of our parameters in here, but it does look like we can say things like T zero is zero. Y zero is also zero. Um, we need to get our final time of interest is two. Um, I'm going to just make some variables for our minimum K and our max K. So min K is going to be four and our max K is gonna be 100 right there, just so that we can tr track the fact that what's our span of K values that we're interested in right here. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, some variables. All right, so um, so I'm gonna say I don't know my like final y or my, maybe my actual y is really going to just be our actual function at two, right? This is exactly what we just did a second ago. I'm just saving this number right here as a variable so we can so that we don't recompute it a million times. We compute it once and then compare against it several times, right? So my actual y, actual final y, or maybe my, I should just call this a final y or something like that, right there. Um, whatever is going to be my actual evaluate at two. And I'm immediately realizing right now I should change that because when I say two, I really mean capital T. I'm trying to use all my variables, not hard code numbers that I would have to change lots of if I wanted to reuse this later. So here's the deal. We want to do both Euler's method and improved Euler's method once for every single value of K from K going from four to 100, where K is our number of subdivisions. We've got loops inside of our loops now, all right? So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say for K in the range, min K to max K. And I do want to get the 100th one in there. Remember that Python does this thing, like if we do uh, list range five to 10, it actually only gives us five to nine. Since I want to get the 100th thing in there, I got to add one to get out to 100. Five to 10, 10 minus five is five, so it should have five elements in it. And it gives us the first five elements starting from five, which is five, six, seven, eight, nine. It doesn't get to 10 right there, right? So that plus one will make us get all the way out to the actual number that we want of 100 out there as our final value, all right? So these are all the Ks that we're going to consider. For, for So in this loop, what are we going to do? Well. Notice that our delta t didn't get evaluated up here because delta t depends on the number of subdivisions and that's gonna change. Now that I am essentially picking a number of subdivisions inside of this for loop, it's gonna start at four subdivisions right now. Now I can go ahead and determine my delta t, right? So my dt is going to be, just like we've been computing it right here, it's going to be my capital T minus my lowercase t right, my final time minus my initial time, divided by my number of subdivisions. The number of subdivisions, K, was a required piece of information, so I had to wait till we were inside of the for loop to actually compute it. This DT changes every pass through the for loop. Four subdivisions, five subdivisions, six subdivisions, 
dt is going to change each time, so we need to update what dt is in each case. So now we can go ahead and we're going to do Euler's method. And then we're going to do improved Euler's method. You know that Euler's method is in itself isn't a for loop, right? But here's a, a, a thing with this is that I don't really care to like save my Y lists and stuff with this. I'm only interested in just the final Y. So I'm not going to be doing my Y lists and my T lists here extensively. All I want to know is what's the final Y we would get to at the end of Euler's method. All I care about is that final Y that we're seeing right here. So I'm going to say my Y1 is always going to start at zero. My time is always going to start at T zero. Right, that's my and that's just like our Y and T. I'm just calling it Y1 to indicate Euler's versus improved Euler's. Here I'm going to say my Y2 is zero and that my T is T0 right there. Right, that's how each of those are going to start. Um, for here, I want to do for each of our subdivisions, so for I in range K, so for each of your subdivisions, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to update what your Y1 is. Y1, what's my new value of Y1? It's the old value of Y1 plus the function evaluated at the current time and the current y value times the delta t as determined by the number of subdivisions that we have. So we've updated our y1. We want to go ahead and increment what our t is. t is going to get bigger by delta t. Increment t, oops, plus equals dt right there. We're going to increment our t. So this is just saying for each of your steps, update y, update t. What's going to happen is at the end of this thing, we're done. So watch this. When I hit enter, my cursor's there. I'm still in the for loop. I'm going to hit backspace once to say, once you're done with the for loop, whatever y1 is, is the final value of y that we're estimating right there. So what I can now do is I can get my error. My error associated with Euler's method here should be the absolute value of our final y1 value minus, what was the thing, what did we call it up here? We called it final y, the actual y value of our true final answer right there. And now I want to take that E1 and stick it into my E1 list. So I'm tracking my errors each time, right? So again, once this for loop is done running, it is then holding Y1 as the last value of Y1 that it ever saw. The last thing we updated it to, that's going to be Y of 2. Y of 2, meaning Y evaluated at time 2 as estimated by Euler's method. So y1 is holding our final y value according to our Euler's method estimate. We want to compare it to our actual solution at y of 2 by taking the difference and the absolute value just so that above or below is not of interest to me. I just want to know how far. That's our error in our estimate. So I'll call that e1 and I'm going to stick it into our error list for the, or for the uh, uh, Euler's method stuff, right? Let's basically do that exact same thing right here. I just have a little bit more code, right? I'm going to define y2 to be 0. I'm going to define t to be t0 right here. Actually, I guess I should be saying what these are initial value and our initial value right there, right? Um, again, I want to do for i in range k. So I want to do k steps, but in this case right here, we know that we need to get our m and our n. So our m is our function evaluated at the current time and our current value. Our n is our function evaluated at the next time, t plus dt, and we want to estimate our next value using regular Euler's method. So this should be our y2 plus f of t plus dt, and right here we should be getting y2 plus m times dt as our estimate for the next y value. So current t value current y value, next t value, Euler's method of next y value. This gets us our second slope of interest. Now we can use that m and n to get our uh, y2 value. So y2, our new value of y2, is our old value of y2 plus, we want to go the average of the two slopes for dt units of time. That's going to update the y2s over and over. We're updating the y values. We also need to update our t values each step of time so that those are changing as well, right? Um, because notice, we keep on using t. t needs to change every pass through the for loop. It needs to change by one of those uh, increments of t right there. 
Again, once this for loop ends, so I'm backing back out of the for loop right here, whatever the final value of y2 is, is exactly our estimate of y of 2. When I say y2, I mean our improved Euler's estimate of y. When I say y of 2, I mean the actual solution at time 2, which is what we're trying to estimate. So our error using our improved Euler's method, E2, should be the absolute value of the difference between what we got for y2 and our final value of y. Our actual value, our real right solution is final y. Our improved Euler's estimate, estimate for y2 is y2. We want to know the difference between them and stick that into our E2 list. Okay, a lot of stuff happened right here. We got nested for loops, multiple for loops nested within another for loop. But the point is, it's going to do all of Euler's at, with four subdivisions, do all of improved Euler's at four subdivisions. It's going to get the final estimate and it's going to find the error of the final estimate and stick it into our list for both of the techniques. Then it's going to end that one pass through this for loop for k. Now k is going to take on the value of 5. It's going to do this whole dang thing again, stick new values into these e1 and e2 lists. Then it's going to make k6, do the whole thing again, stick those errors into our error lists up there. And so what my question to you is now is, can we compare these errors in a meaningful way? So let's check this guy out right here. So I'm going to run that code. I see no errors. It ran. What a giant block of code this is right here. But I see the number in there. It ran. No errors. Yeah. Um, and so what I now want to do is two things. We're going to plot the comparisons in our errors, and then we're going to numerically compare the errors. So so what I would like to do here now is I would like to plot each of our error setups right here. So here's what we're going to do. I want to do plot dot plot. And what I want to do is I need some x values. Well, our x values were really our k values that went from 4 to 100. So I'm going to do exactly that. I'm going to do range min k max k plus 1. Those were really the, the k values that we used. What were the associated errors was the e1 list. I'm going to go ahead and make this be black dots with the k dot right there. And I want to give this the label for a legend of uh, Euler errors. I'm just going to copy this whole line right here. And the only thing I really need to change is I want to do the E2 list. I'm going to make them blue dots. And I would like this to be improved Euler's errors. All right. Um, some other tiny things I'm going to want to see here. Let's go ahead. I know that I'm going to want a plot.grid. I know that I'm going to want a, uh, a plot.legend being turned on. Uh, wait a minute, I feel like I don't actually need that. I feel like I get a little bit of confusion associated with some of these things right here. Plotting stuff isn't directly math stuff. You just got to barely be able to use this to be uh, manageable right here. And let's go ahead and well, let's just see what this looks like right now. All right, so why am I getting a inverted thing for improved Euler's errors right there? It looks like we're getting a Mm -hmm. Looks like we made a little bit of a mistake with our with our blue curve right here. Our blue curve is improved Euler's. So let's go ahead and take a look at our E2 list. Apparently we made some small error right here. So where am I seeing that? Y2, Y0. We did start T0 and Y0 each at 0, right? And that was the correct thing to do right there. Uh, 4 to 100, my for loops are the same, y1 is y0, t is t0, y2 is y0, t is y t0, for i in range k, m is f of t comma y2, n is f of t plus delta t, oh, I don't, well, I don't need to do, oh, okay, I see where my mistake is right here, check this out, I didn't t put times dt right here. This is our, this is really just, uh, well, okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. This should have been, m times d, t, right? Oh, uh, so I was trying, I was getting ahead of myself. I did my y2 plus right there. The y2 plus is going to get built in right there. Uh, what I really just wanted for myself right here, I think, was just this. 
this is my t value this is my y value right here I think I was way way overdoing it for myself right there I was getting like a line ahead of myself so my n slope is f evaluated at the later time this right here is Euler's method to get my later time after uh, where we're currently at the current one is y2 but I updated it using m right there the previous times slope and I think that now we're going to be good to go with this guy this line is correct I was just incorporating some of my next line of code into my previous line right there I think that this is good right here let's double check this right here let's run it oh there we go now I'm seeing this here so this is very satisfying to me what I'm seeing is that Euler's method errors are the black dots improved Euler's uh, method errors are the blue dots we're seeing much less error from improved Euler's method for all the number of subdivisions out there and I might say to you something like about how much less well let's go ahead and take a look at getting some comparisons of these things right here and by the way I should say for being responsible people right here some other things we should throw on this plot are plot dot x label which is our errors oh no sorry that's our number of subdivisions Our plot dot y label is our um, absolute errors and our plot dot title should be comparison of errors and now we've got some nice labels on the x and y axis and on the title right there cool so as our last thing for today and this is our really really important part is analyzing the errors here What I want to do is ask the question, how much better is uh, two major questions here. And for each technique, if I double the number of subdivisions, what happens to our amount of error all right those are the two questions that I want to ask I should probably put question marks on the end of each of them right here so let's go ahead and take a look at each of these guys right here so one thing I can do is I can say compare the final errors from each list so I'm going to do my e1 uh, list I'm going to take its last item negative the negative one index and I'm going to divide by e2 list the last item from e2 list this is going to take our 100 subdivisions with Euler's method divided by the 100 subdivision uh, error with uh, improved Euler's method and what I'm seeing here is it looks like we are getting uh, oh okay I know why it looks like with 100 subdivisions about 41 times as much error as improved Oilers. All right. Um, so I can see here I did my ratio of errors and it looks like Euler's method E1 my, my ones are Euler's E2's are improved Oilers 41 times as much error from Euler's as improved Oilers so improved Oilers with 100 subdivisions with this differential equation did uh, one way to say this would be it had a 141th as much error as using regular Euler's method much 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 better right there so that's a pretty obvious improvement right there but this number is going to vary based on the number of subdivisions and how steep our slopes are with our curve like lots of things affect that but like no arguing clearly better 41 times as much error with our worst method than with our better method right here here is the much more important part of this here for each technique what impact does doubling the number of subdivisions have? This is this is this is the big question right here. That's really a, a primary takeaway from this whole chapter of stuff right here. So check this out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get some indices of some values. I'm going to call final end my final index. That's the last thing. That's the length of the E1 list. 
minus one because our indices numbers if there's a hundred things in a list then the last thing is index 99 because it goes from 0 to 99 instead of from 1 to 100 so I got to subtract one just to make that line up right there and I'm gonna get some other indices I'm gonna get a halfway indices uh, halfway end and that should really just basically be our final end divided by two I just need to make sure it's an integer in case it was an odd number so we're, we're doing this as a light estimate right here but I'll do my final end uh, divided by two and I'm even going to go so far as to get a third, a third, uh, like what's one third of the way through here. Um, so I'll also do a final end over three wrapped up in int just to make sure that one really I don't trust is going to be an integer right there. And just to double check these, let's go ahead and see what these guys kind of look right, like right here. Um, And we can see that we're at 96, half of 96 is 48 subdivisions, a third of 96 subdivisions is 32 subdivisions. So this is saying, uh, you know, this is like our how many subdivisions are we, are we going to be considering here? So check this out. When I compare just regular old Euler's method to having 48 subdivisions versus 96 subdivisions, right? So I double my number of subdivisions, what's the impact on my error here? So I'm going to do E1 list at the final index. So it's going to be the error with 96 subdivisions. Versus the error with 48 subdivisions. And what I'm getting is that when it looks like we doubled the number of subdivisions with Euler's and got half the error. Well, that kind of sucks because that seems like it's a linear relationship that if I were to triple the number of subdivisions, I'd get one third the area. It's kind of lame. What happens if we do this with improved Euler's? So let's do this again, but I want to grab all my E2s. So I'm going to copy and paste this guy down here. And I'm going to change these to E2s. So now I'm going to compare my full to my half. Ooh, and we're only getting about a quarter of the error. Let's do it again, but let's instead do this now with 32. All right, and I'm going to do my third way, my, my one third of the way right here. So this is saying if you do three times as much, three times as many subdivisions. Uh, oh, I didn't do my, I want to do my E2s. Notice that number right there is about a third. And notice this number right here looks an awful lot to me like one ninth. So here is a very important conclusion for us right here. Oh, 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 let me get back in here. Very important conclusion.
Here's our important words. to improved Eulers as a numerical method of order two. There is a quadratic relationship between the number of subdivisions and the amount of error. So this is way better. If you do 10 times as many subdivisions with improved Eulers, you're only going to have one one hundredth the error as opposed to 10 times as many subdivisions with regular Eulers would only get you one tenth the error right there. Um, and so as my final statement for the day right now, I would say, so you should now be asking yourself, think the Runga-Kutta method will fare. And here is the important thing that I'm asking you to guess before we go on to the next section is, why do you think they call this Runga-Kutta method RK4? Maybe it has a lot to do with the stuff that's on this page right here. So what we're going to end up seeing, um, seriously, and the, and the comment I'm seeing in chat right here is it's crazy to me how rigorous error analysis was before computers. Um, but I kind of like to think, and so one, you're totally right because man, it's so easy to do this by just doing these divisions out here and seeing these relationships. But also your error analysis mattered way more back in the day before computers because like they needed to know if this was going to be like a viable estimation technique. This is more of like, are our estimates good? Why would we waste a week doing by hand computations if we know that we're not going to get much improvement? Um, and so it's, uh, it's, it's more valuable to have that kind of uh, awareness right there of the goodness of your approximating techniques. So they call the Runga-Kutta method RK4 for a reason. Um, and that has to do with its uh, numerical order right there. Numerical. Um, oh my gosh. I got typing real fast right there. Um, so this is our distinction between Eulers and improved Eulers. It's a linear versus a quadratic uh, relationship with the error that's associated with the estimates that they produce. And the Runga Kutta 4 method is going to do even better than that. It's called Runga Kutta 4 for a good reason because we're gonna have a fourth order relationship. Um, so when we double the number of sub intervals, we're gonna get only 1 16th the error because two to the fourth is 16. That's what we're going to expect to see when we go hit up our Runga Kutta stuff in our next video right here. So uh, I'm going to wrap it up right here. I know I went really fast today and I typed a whole lot, but I also didn't want to just do a two hour video when you guys are capable of pausing to look at my code and to read my words here. Um, so I hope that this was still a manageable video, even though I went really, really fast right here and made some light mistakes in my programming along the way right there. Um, this was the one thing, this was my one line where I made a mistake in there and I did fix that. This plot right here should make you feel really good about our improved Eulers or humans method being much, much better right there. Um, so that's going to wrap it up for me for the day. We're going to hit Runga Cut a four in our next video, which I'm probably going to make tomorrow morning. That will be our last video until we hit section 3.1 and that one won't be I should be making that video on like Thursday March 25th so 20 days from now is when I plan to make my next video for 3-1 because we have spring break week and we have our midterm week uh, baby week um, is the week after spring break pick them back up with 3.1 uh, so again I'll see you guys for 7-3 in the next video and that'll be our last video for about three weeks here have a good one everybody I'll see you guys then